right now. Hello, folks. Uh, Dan Crawl here again. Thanks for tuning back into the Brit Kanawa West Hancock podcast. This is episode 37. And tonight I have former Brit coach and teacher Bob Horner with me. Uh, thanks for coming on, Coach Horner. Good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I'm excited for this one. Bob is a uh, North Iowa coaching legend. Um, spent a lot of time in Mason City, won a couple championships. So I've been real excited for this one for a while, and we're going to talk some Brit stuff as well. So that'll be fun. Uh, like always, I want to recognize my sponsors. I have 19 of them tonight. So like always, it's going to take a few extra minutes to um, get that advertising in for my great sponsors that are very supportive of the Sanger Legacy Fund. So without further ado, I want to thank my 19 sponsors, the Brit Car Truck Bike and Tractor Night Cruise, Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company, Jay Hiscox of State Farm Insurance, First State Bank, Mojo Productions, Daniels Auto Collision, Katie Salon and Tanning, Deemer Realty, Nick Schmidt, Kelly Real Estate, Sidetrack Lanes Bowling Alley, Wilson's Diner, Brit Food Center, Levi Don Trucking, Miller and Sons Golf Cars, Brit Vet Clinic, The World with Nate Podcast, and Johnson Drainage. So thanks to those sponsors for coming on. I was telling Bob that they pump a lot of money into the Sanger Legacy Fund, so we're always grateful for them. Spring sports update, not much to report. Uh, meets haven't started yet, just practice at this point. Boys and girls golf, head coach Chris Gobelai, and then boys track is led by Matt Welp, and girls track is some guy named Mark Sanger we've heard of. So uh, speaking of Sangers, we want to remind everyone about the Sanger Legacy Fund. Go to sangerstrong.com to donate. Uh, you can set up recurring payments. I already know a few people who do that. Uh, you can do that through sangerstrong.com. That money will go towards the new West Hancock Hall of Fame, scholarships, uh, stuff for activities and athletics at West Hancock. So it goes to a great cause. Way back when, uh, 10 episodes ago on episode 27, I talked to Mark Sanger about the 2021 state championship. 20 episodes ago, I talked to the 1996 state championship football team featuring Jeff Sanger. And 30 episodes ago in episode seven, I talked to Rick Sanger. So it just worked out that I had a bunch of Sangers on that for my way back when. I'll have those posted um, on the social media uh, pages when I post this podcast later tonight. Johnson Drainage is sponsoring this episode. Johnson Drainage is owned by Scott and Ryan Johnson. They provide timely and professional farm drainage work in the Brit and Kanawha area, and they have been doing that for 22 years now. Call Scott and Ryan at 641-860-1111 for all your farm drainage needs. And thanks to Sidetrack Lanes and Brit for sponsoring the podcast. Sidetrack Lanes opened in Brit in 1996. Go bowl at 411 Main Avenue North. Enjoy some food, a drink or two while you're bowling. Join the league, check out their events on their Facebook page. Call Sidetrack Lanes at 843 4567. Uh, check out their Facebook page, give them a call, head on up to Sidetrack Lanes and Ron Bauer. All right, Bob, here we go. Like I said, I'm excited for this. I've been uh, had this one on my calendar for quite a while and I'm pumped to talk to you. So I always like to start. Tell us, you know, where, before you get to our, the coaching and teaching part, where did you grow up? And how did you end up in Iowa? I already know where you grew up, but tell people where you're from and how you ended up all the way out here. Okay, well, I went to school. I'm originally from Lakewood, New Jersey, and uh, I went through high school there and lived there most of my life until I got to Iowa. Uh, our freshman football coach in high school uh, took the head football job at William Penn College, mm -hmm. and he talked to us about going to school uh, out here, but... Uh, we didn't take school that seriously at that time. Yeah. Uh, it was too bad at that time. But anyway, uh, so he recommended the junior college at Mason City or Coffeyville Junior College. And myself and four other of my buddies all played football. We chose Mason City. And we were going to go down there to play football down at William Penn back in the 60s. So that's, that's how I got out here from New Jersey was football. And then I met my lovely wife my second year in junior college. And uh, you know what they say, once you marry an Iowa girl, you're here forever. So yep. I've been here since 1965, and now I don't have an Eastern accent so <laughs> anymore. So yeah, one of uh, one of my friends. From, you know. Yeah, one of my friends from church is from New Jersey, and he's lived here for 30 years. But you would thought he just moved here yesterday <laughs> with his accent. It's thick. 
Um, and yeah, that, that Eastern accent is kind of distinct sometimes. Yeah, yeah. You never know what's coming out of their mouth sometimes. But right. uh, so, were there no community colleges out that way, or was it more just that coach had connections out here? Well, you know, the, there was, but at that time, you know, we didn't take school that seriously, and which is something that I would not tell my players and and, and kids now. You know, when they're in yep. school. Uh, you know, we were always respectful uh, to our teachers and everything, and uh, but we just didn't take our grades as serious as what we should have. But he had the connections out here, and he was coming out here to William Penn from okay. New Jersey, and uh, that's how we got out here, through the connections through our high school coach. Okay, so you started at Nyack then, and then uh, where'd you end up after Nyack? Because that's a two-year yeah. college. Yeah, it, it was Mason City Junior College. I came out here in 1965 to 1967. Uh, actually, uh, I quarterbacked out here. I played football. I also was a point guard on the basketball team. So I was a shortstop on the baseball team. So I actually played all three sports. Nice. In your college. Nowadays, you couldn't do that because they uh, practice year round on the one sport. But back then, when you were done, you were completely done. And if you wanted to play another sport, you absolutely could. If I think that I might be the last uh, one to ever play three sports out here at junior college, wow. that was 65 to 67. Yep, cool. And then did you went on, did you go on another two years after that somewhere? Well, that, that, that's a long story. Yeah. I got married, and then I actually worked for uh, uh, Decker's, which was a meatpacking place here in Mason City. And I worked there for eight years on the cutting floor. Okay. And they wanted me to be a foreman. Uh, at that time, I had a couple girls. I had two girls that were born, Tracy and Heather. I'm at Heather's house right now because there's no way I could set this up with you. I don't <laughs> So, But uh, I, I worked there for eight years. And then I got a phone call from Mark Lumblatt, who was a football coach at Nyack. And he was my football coach when I came out here from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. said, coach, just leave and they needed a, a backfield coach, would I be interested? So I worked for the packing house and I did the offensive backfield for Nyack. And I went home and told my wife after a month or so, you know, this is something I always wanted to do. I missed the boat. Is there anything we can do about it? And my wife was 100% behind me. We had two girls. Uh, we basically sold everything that we had. And I went back to upper Iowa because I was still eligible to play there. They were. Uh, NAIA at that time, mm -hmm. not too long to play at an NCAA school. So I went back to Upper Iowa when I was 27 years old, and I actually played basketball, baseball. I started third base for him on the baseball team. You didn't have to run or do any of that conditioning like you did in basketball. Yeah. Not in basketball to get going. And then between my junior and senior year, they switched over NCAA Division three, and they ruled me ineligible about a week before the first basketball oh, and play. So then I helped Bill Prohaska coach uh, at Upper Iowa. And uh, that's really what got me going on my career. So I would have to say one of the people that had the biggest influences on me was Art Lumblad, who gave me the opportunity here to coach. And then the second guy that had the biggest influence is Bob Sanger, which we'll talk about a little bit later on here. Yeah, and Bill Prohaska, that name sounds familiar. Is he, does he have some North Iowa ties, or am I thinking of someone else? No, Bill Prohaska used to be the head coach at North Iowa Buffalo Center for years. There we go. Okay. Way back in the day, it was Buffalo Center. And he was yeah. there for quite a while, very successful. And he went from Buffalo Center to Upper Iowa. Okay. He's probably from Protovin. And when he was at Protovin, I think he held the singles – season scoring record for a single game for a long, long time. So okay. a shooter and, and uh, he's, he's still down there at Fayette and uh, great guy gave me an opportunity. Of course, I was 27 years old when he came up mm -hmm. and recruited me. So when I talked to him, we actually went to a place that was called the Green Mill of Mason City, had a couple of drinks and talked about recruiting, which nice. you couldn't do that with your recruits nowadays, yeah. you know, 18, 19 year old. So yeah, cool. Yeah, and it's cool because Upper Iowa, there's quite the Brit pipeline with Upper Iowa. Um, oh, that that that's unbelievable. When I got to Brit with my first teaching job, I could not believe the number of people from Upper Iowa. Yep. Jim Rums, 
Sangers. I, I mean, it was just, you're right. It was a pipeline, uh, like a little upper Iowa up north here. So uh, yep. I would put out a lot of people in the teaching profession and put out a lot of people that have really been really successful. So yep. the, the, uh, the home state for the upper Iowa alumni. Yep. Yep. I know about every other person I've interviewed on the podcast seems to be an upper Iowa grad who's taught or coached a Brit. So um, it's kind of fun to add another one to that. Um, uh, it, it was. Yep, definitely. So, yeah, I, I heard Bill Prohaska. I'm like, and my parents are from Buffalo Center. My grandparents are from Buffalo oh. Center. Um, you, let me see, you might have known my dad, Mark Crawl. He was a yeah, pitcher. You know, that sound, yes. Center. Yep. Was he a left-hander? Nope, he was a righty. Um, but he okay, was but I, I remember that he did play, didn't he? Yep, he was a very good pitcher in baseball. He played basketball uh, up through his, he didn't go out his senior year. Uh, when would he have graduated from there, Dan? He was the last Buffalo Center class, so that would have been 78 or 79. Okay, so, so been... that's right around in there because I remember Yagi. Yep, you know, Dan Yagi. Uh, yep. Tall, boy Rod, all tall. I mean, yep. they uh, Buffalo Center has some great teams. They had some really good athletes. And football wise, yep. with uh, Coach Smith, I believe, he was coached there. Tom so, Tom Smith was yeah. there for a long time. Yep, I know Tom. Yeah, they, they've had a lot of good athletes. Joe Angsman was there forever after uh, Bill Prohaska left. And, uh, yep. yep. One of my all time favorite guys. Was yep, the, he was a good coach. He, yep. You could hear yeah. him kicking, kicking the back of the bleacher with his heel when he wasn't happy with a three second call or a five second call. That was. Something he will have that high pitch from the sideline. All of a sudden, he's got that high pitch coming out. Yeah. Yep. He, yep. He, remember that purple jacket? He had to. I hope he had more than one because that's yeah. the only reward. Nice. Yep. He was. He's a good guy. Still lives in Buffalo Center. His son lives just down the street from him now with his family. So, yep. Good. I think good his people. daughter uh, is part owner or her husband of the uh, Fat Hill Brewery here in Mason City. I okay. Believe. Yep. Lee, that's his daughter that owns that here on, on Main Street. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, cool. So, well, I got to get to some sponsors here because, like I said, we have 19 of them. So here we go. Mojo Productions, another amazing sponsor of mine. Uh, they're based in Brit. They're your full DJ business that specializes in weddings. They're fully insured. They give back to the community. And he's also the presenter of the Brit Car, Truck, Bike, and Tractor Night, which is another one of my sponsors. Contact Jared Wingert at 515-408-1074. Send him a message on Facebook if you can do it that way. Wilson's Diner at 441 Main Avenue North in Britt. Head up there for breakfast, lunch, and supper. They're closed on Tuesdays, but open the other six days of the week. Just check out their Facebook page or call for their hours. Call Wilson's Diner at 843-0550. Wilson's Diner is great food at great prices. They look forward to serving you. Wilson's Diner in Britt. And then one of my long-term sponsors is Renee Deemer with Deemer Realty. Hometown hospitality and service with a smile. That's what Deemer Realty is all about. Helping buyers and sellers make a smooth transition when buying within or to the area is their top priority. Serving North Central Iowa since 1999, Deemer Realty has steadily grown over the years, establishing an outstanding record of sales in the North Iowa area that speaks to their dedication to every customer. That's Deemer Realty. Go to DeemerRealty.net to check them out. And I have Levi Don Trucking. Thanks to Levi Don and his trucking company for sponsoring a bunch of my episodes. Call Levi at 641-860-0077 or look him up on Facebook. That's Levi Don Trucking. All right. Uh, we talked about this before we hit record. Talk about the interview process coming to Brit because you said some guy named Bob Sanger was interviewing you that day. Well, it, it, it was really, uh, it was really iconic. I, I interviewed a two play. I had two interviews set up for that one day and I wasn't done with school yet. So mm -hmm. I went at Woden Crystal Lake when they were still in the high school uh, back then in the seventies. Yep. And then I went in the afternoon at Brit. So when I came to the Brit interview, uh, they bring me in the back room and Jack Fisher and Ted Runyon, the superintendent, Bob Sanger was in there, Bob Grandjeanette, who was the athletic director. And they were, uh, in there at that time because they wanted also an assistant football coach. So that's, I've always heard of Bob, you know, before I even went there, because Bob was an icon even before I, you know, started coaching. Mm -hmm. But the first time I really met him and we're sitting there, you know, and he's talking, he says, well, he says, uh, 
Bob, if you get hired for this job, you're going to have the defense. They go, what? <laughs> says, uh, you're going to have the defense if you get hired for this job. I said, in all due respect, Bob, I was a quarterback. They didn't let us play defense when I played. I don't know anything about defense. He says, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. If you get hired, you better talk to your friends and read books because you got the defense. Oh, boy. And if I didn't get the job in the first day of practice, Bob goes, you got the defense. What are we going to run? Five, two, wide tackle, six, five, three. <laughs> what do you want to do? I says, well, I'll let you know as soon as I look it up. <laughs> <We're doing." laughs> but, but it was always kind of funny because he, he had such an influence on me because I knew how to treat my assistants after I worked with him because I have been an assistant for a long time at different places. And a lot of head coaches will not let you do anything. They do all the, they don't let you talk. They try to, you know, do everything themselves. And, and Bob was a guy that would delegate his authority and make you feel important. Yep. Like really wanted to work for him because you felt you were doing something. And, yep. and uh, I always took that from him. My assistants under me will always have a say and they will always have an opportunity to uh, talk to the kids. They won't be on the back shelf. And that's one thing that I really got from Bob. He was just great when it came to delegating the authority and making you feel important, uh, you know, to want to work for him. And, and other than that, you know, he, he was a great guy. I could go on and on forever about Bob. We would go out. I had my oldest daughter, Tracy, and Heather, my two oldest daughters. And, of course, they had. Kevin and uh, Ricky at the time. So we would go out to the farm and we would all get together. And I'll tell you what, I didn't know if my two daughters were going to make it. I looked out the window one day and Kevin and Ricky had Heather and, and Tracy on a three wheeler. They were going like 50 miles an hour around the fields out. There. I go to my wife, my God, they're not going to make it. Somebody's crash. <laughs> so I, I mean, it was just, we had a lot of memories like that. We got together a lot, you know, with the kids. Uh, had a great time one time. Uh, I knew how to rough housing. So uh, we roughed Bob's house. And if you ever been to his farm out there, that's mm -hmm. a high building. So myself, uh, Bill Barnes, uh, Terry Barton, the old assistant that used to be there, Jim Timmerman, Bob and myself, we roughed his house. And it was amazing that nobody fell off that roof. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was just unbelievable the things and and the friendship that we created in the two years that Bev and I and my wife were there is just amazing. It still goes today, and we were only there two years because mm -hmm. it feels so comfortable. It makes you feel like a home, like you feel like yeah. all the things. you were going through your sponsors there. All those sponsors that you have there, Dan, I mean, they're all familiar names back in the seventies. So, yep. I mean, stay there generation after generation. And that's what makes Brit such a special community. And to me, that's what makes them such a bomb when it comes to athletics because mm -hmm. of that family tradition. So yep. uh, it, it, it was a great feeling, Bob, when I took the job. And if I didn't have aspirations to be a head coach and also a basketball coach, I could have been very comfortable. You stayed in Brit forever. Yep. Yeah, and it's cool. You said you were only there for two years, but what are we, 40 some years later? And here we are talking about yeah, 46 Brit. years, 46 years later. And you asked me the other night if I had any Brit stuff left. Yeah. I, if, if I did, I'm sure nothing would fit. Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. Some of my other podcasts, uh, Rod Barkema from Kanawa, he still had stuff and he put, he didn't wear it, but he put it up behind him and He's like, oh, I'm yeah, su held on to it. I'm surprised he didn't have some of that four City stuff he has on. Didn't he coach over at Forest City, Rod? I, I wouldn't have allowed that. So, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> I was going to say. Before we hit record, I'd be like, Rod, we got to we gotta fix this. Sorry about that. So, yeah. Uh, so, um, but, no, a lot, a lot of stories with Bob. He was a great guy. And uh, how he coached was just you know, kind of a no-nonsense. You knew what he was going to run. He was going to oh, yeah. T. Hey, stop it. That was his philosophy. You can stop it. Great. But you know what we're going to do? And he only did it for 50 years. Yeah. Look, yeah success he had. Yep. So when I left Brit, 
So I got the second over at West Bend. I went to West Bend to take my first head coaching job. I was the head basketball and head baseball coach. And after the first year there, the football coach got terminated. His job did. So I took the head football job. And I'll never forget, guess what I ran? Ian. We had the three formations, 128, you know, with the first number was the formation, second yep. number was the back, third number was the, the oh. hole. And uh, so here comes Jim Timmerman, Bill Hudson, and Sanger over to a game. And I'm looking over there on the opposing side. And here's those three sitting on the opposing side over there. After the game, they stayed overnight. Guys sitting on the other side over there for well we we brought some uh refreshments you know and some some toddies we didn't want to sit on your side nice. <laughs> so it was, it was just funny and we had a blast and that might have been the first time that a head coach in west bend went down to a local bar yeah <laughs> anybody ever went downtown but we did that night when they were there nice yeah, yeah, good people, and uh, yeah, like I said, forty some years later, here we are, and it's it's great the the support you got from them. Uh, do you remember how much you signed your first contract for in Brit? I'm always curious about this question. Oh, you know, back in seventy, thinking it might have been only like eight nine thousand dollars. It wasn't yeah. it, it wasn't a lot, you know. And then with the coaching, I'm sure it was maybe. Total fourteen, fifteen thousand. Yeah. That's really a long time ago, and and you know, forty six years. But yeah, it's nothing like it is today. You know. So. Yeah, yeah, different world. But man, I, I I'm a teacher. I teach fourth grade, and I coach golf right now. And I talk to people like you, and you know, the Sangers and everyone else. I'm like, man, I come almost wish I would have been a teacher and coach back in that day. It, it sounds like a just a fun era to be a part of. So well, things that are things are, are different. I think. I think when you have older coaches that are still coaching today, Dan, that I think it's because they were able to adapt mm -hmm. because I definitely wouldn't be able to coach the way I used to coach when I was younger. And I think mostly everybody that's been through those years will tell you that because uh, things just change, you know, and, yep. and the, uh, the environment changes and expectations change and, and parents are more involved and you have more AAU things and it's yeah. just so hard anymore. You know, yeah. these now by the time they get to be seventh and eighth grade, kids that are on these traveling teams, they've been all over the country. Yeah. They've mm -hmm. they'll ever do in high school. And, you know, sometimes it's just, it, it's tough. Yeah. You know, I meant to work in anymore. So. Yeah. It's a diff different, different time. That's for sure. Uh, so golf. I love. You got a good sport. Stay with that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, this is my fourth year. My first year, I had five kids, and they weren't even sure if we'd have a program. Like, oh, if someone shows up, they show up. You'll be our coach. And then the second year was COVID, so we didn't have a season. Last year, I had eight kids. This year, I'm up to 18. And um, I have a couple freshmen end up cracking the varsity lineup for next week. So I'm excited. Uh, we have a good mix of kids and all the grades. And Decided to see what happens. So well, that, that's a good sport. I, we just love it. We get a yep. year that we go off quite a bit. So yep. I'm just hoping the state association doesn't do what they've been talking about for years. They want to put all golf in the fall instead mm. of the spring. And I'm like, that's gonna kill off the sport because me personally, if a kid says I have to choose between football and golf, I almost want them to pick football because they only get to play football till they're Right out of high school, they can play golf their whole life, you know. So, right. Hopefully, knock on wood, they don't change that or anything. But we'll see what yeah. happens. So, yeah. Yeah. So your uh, your first season of football, like you said, you were the defensive guy. Uh, Nineteen seventy six, you guys went four and four. That was fifth in the conference. Uh, do you remember much specifically about that season? You know, when I came in, I I think. The one thing, you know, everybody talked about, I came in 76, and the one thing everybody talked about was the uh, team from 73, yep. Bob Sweers, you know, the running oh, yeah. back. I didn't know any of those kids, but, uh, uh, you know, they talked about that, and I think they had maybe, you know, a few down years there, and then Bob was just starting to get back on track again mm -hmm. with the 
four. And um, the conference was tough that year. I, I remember uh, uh, Rick Fangman. I think it was Rick. You know, a Fangman boy played. Dom boy played. Uh, Fletcher uh, was on that team. I remember Doug Sloan. Scott Johnson, who I believe was one of your uh, spots. And, yep. and we had some talent. There was some talent on that. Just had to get them corralled a little bit. Yeah. You know, they, 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 a, a pretty good group. And, uh, but they were a, a fun-loving group. I mean, they had a, they had a good time. And uh, they were some good-sized kids and some very athletic kids. And uh, I think that, that kind of run there on 76. And after that, we weren't, we were so, so the following year, but then after I left, always keeping an eye on it, boy, he got things going again. And man, it's just, it's been taken off ever since. But uh, yep. although those two years I had the defense and uh, I was never afraid to call anything because Bob always made you feel comfortable. Uh, you know, even if you made a mistake, mm -hmm. there was one story. The first game that I coached was over at Lake Mills. And um, they had a, a kid by the name of Skellinger, who was only about 5'5", five, five, but he was tougher than nails, middle linebacker and running back. And coach told me we had to go to the bus at halftime because that Lake Mills was quite a ways from the locker room. So we go to the bus. He said, you got to really get after him, give him a, a good speech, good talking to Because I was kind of timid back then. I mean, you know, I didn't say much, sister. Yep. So I went on the bus and said a couple words that I couldn't repeat here. Bob, the oversized says, I didn't mean that. You can't say that, Coach. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, so I just kind of like, you know, he, he mentored me and and told me things I could do and couldn't do yeah. at, a, at that time. But it, it, it was really funny. He called me, you can't say that. Okay. <laughs> Anymore, so okay, tell me what to say. Then, please. <laughs> yeah, we can't, I can't say it here. We yeah, two kids watching, but that's funny. Oh, so, uh, yeah, he, he was a great guy, but back then, you know, all the teams were tough. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, you didn't get an easy like you were going to go into a game and say, Hey, I know we're going to win this one, no matter how much you prepare. I mean, it was tough all the way around. Yeah. And he, came to Mason City, it was back in that day, all the teams were tough. If you didn't come, you were going to get beat. I don't yep. care how good you were. So. Yep. Yeah, looking at your 76 season, you whooped Rockford, lost by 15 to Belmont, lost by 6 to 4 City, beat Buffalo Center by 12, lost by 21 to Lake Mills, won by 2 to North against Northwood, uh, beat Garner by 6, and then Osage won against you guys 63 to nothing. Osage was kind of a powerhouse. Then, back, back then, then they, they were tough. And also back then, you know, Forest City was really tough. And Larry mm -hmm. Holt, remember that name? When he was a football coach here before he became principal, they yeah. had some good teams. But Osage was was the team. Of course, Osage and, and Forest City, you know, were quite a bit bigger than everybody else at that time. Yep. Yep, they're three A and we're one A, so right. So makes a difference. Yeah, they're you know they have more kids to choose from, but uh, like I said, they had some real good kids uh, back then. So, but yep. uh, tell you what, Britt right now, I I don't know where he's getting them all, but those linemen and those running backs, they just run over people now. Mm -hmm. Tell you yep. what they're gonna do, but here they're gonna stop me. So and they have yep. a hard stopping yeah i mean we've won two of the last three state titles and we should have won it in 2018 we were inches away from going to that championship game we would have won in the right. finals uh talking to people in town right now i said how's 2022 gonna look and they're like uh oh, good really good like people are pretty excited we have a lot of i think they said we had about five or six sophomores play a lot of varsity this last year and without those guys on jv the jv still went undefeated so there's just a lot of a lot of good kids coming up, so it's gonna it's gonna continue for a little while longer, thankfully. So yeah, and and uh, you know that the thing is, there's such a tradition there now that people just expect it. Yeah, and, you know when you expect it, you know you, the kids they don't want to let anybody down. So yep. you don't want to be that group. Yep, definitely. All right, we're gonna get to some sponsors here, and then we'll keep moving along. 
Uh, thanks to the Brit Car Truck Bike and Tractor Night Crews and Jared Winger. They're sponsoring 30 episodes of the podcast to promote this, these events. Uh, they uh, have events on July 20th, August 17th, and September 21st in 2022. They're all on Wednesday nights. Uh, Jared and Mojo uh, have been in Brit for 15 years now. The fifth annual event has free kids activities. Trophies are presented for all categories, and a $1,000 award is given out at each show. You can't beat free admission and great food and drink from Brit local vendors only. Check out the video. Um, I'm going to post their website, BritCarCruise.com. I'll post that to my um, page. And then Michael and Brianne Ewing, uh, Mon Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company with locations in Brit, Kanawha, Clarion, Belmont, and Dows. Mike's a 1998 West Hancock grad, and his family's been privileged to care for the communities of Brit and Kanawha since 1977. Find him online at ewingfh.com or on Facebook. Give him a call at 843-3839 or 762-3211. That's Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company. And then the Brit Food Center is one of my newer sponsors. They're locally owned, family operated, hometown grocery store in Brit. They offer fresh produce, fresh cut meat, fresh bakery, and homemade deli items. They're working hard to meet the needs and requests of their communities. Brit Food Center is a proud supporter of West Hancock schools. They're open seven days a week from eight to eight, except on Sunday when they're open eight to six. Check them out at BritFoodCenter.com. Follow them on Facebook for deals and specials. Call them at 843-4429. That's the Brit Food Center. Yeah, and then Bob, your uh, next and last football season in Brit 1977, you guys improved a little bit. You went five and three and got up to fourth in the conference. So like you kind of alluded to, those any more, if I hear four and four, five and three, we count those as down years. Uh, back then, they, I mean, you're going in the North Iowa Conference and getting 500 or better. That's not a bad season from one of the two or three smallest schools in the conference at the time. So uh, well, it, about it, that last season. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. You know, that's what I said. I think after Bob had that state uh, championship team or in 73, 73. what their record was leading up to that. But I think that they were might have been under 500 for a couple of years there in a row. So then things started going in the right direction again. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of those kids that I mentioned, Thangmans, Dawns, Fletchers, Zools, and all those kids were juniors that came back. And uh, the Cooks, I, I believe there were some Cooks in there. And I know I'm missing some people, but I have a hard time remembering last week now with my... <laughs> So remembering 46 years ago um, is, is quite a while ago, but uh, no, I, I'll tell you, those two years meant a lot to me. They laid the foundation to me as far as how I coach and like I said, how I treat my assistants as, as coaches and a lot's got to do with that with Bob. Uh, I loved uh, Linda. I taught elementary P eighth grade in the morning with Linda. Yeah. I, all the stories, you know, from the night before, you know, with Lyndon Bob, what have you, after a game or something. But uh, it, was, it was kind of funny. They, they, they were just great people, and they meant a lot. And, and the Sangers and the Timmermans and the Beaches and the Brums. And, I, I mean, people been there for forever. Uh, you know, they just didn't pick up, you know, and leave in a year or two. They stayed there and made Brit their home and yep. made what it is today. So... Uh, hats off to them. Brit will always be a special place for me. You know, I'll yep. never, never forget Brit, and uh, it was a great place. Matter of fact, it was kind of hard to go back to Lake Mills because then I knew we were going to wind up playing West Hancock, uh, yep. seeing football. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't quite as worried at the time, you know, yeah. but, uh, you know, Football was just, you didn't want to play West Hancock. You want to play Brit. I mean, you know, you knew it was going to be a knockdown, drag out fight. And plus at Lake Mills, we kind of struggled a little bit with, with football. And uh, so, uh, but we would have our football games and then Bob and Linda and Timmermans, they would stay overnight at our place at Lake Mills and vice versa when we go back. So it been a lot of great memories. Yep. Yep. And I, I say this all the time, but, you know, Coach Sanger gets a lot of the recognition because he was the coach and the interviews and the paper and stuff. But, man, Linda was and still is, you know, amazing, like just uh, uh, one of the pillars of that community. And she did she did the behind the scenes stuff. She was always the person 
in the background doing everything. And she was the person that all the kids would go to when they had problems or issues or needed help or advice. Um, so I always, every chance I get to shout out Mrs. Sanger, I take that opportunity. So I'm always oh, throwing that out. Linda, behind every good coach, there's a better, a better woman. I'm, I'm telling you right now, because the things that a coach's <laughs> wife has to put up with not being home, flexible hours, mm -hmm. uh, parents being upset with you and bringing it home. I mean, the, the wives are the ones that are the backbone, like you said, of the families and, and make it what it is because uh, if you don't have a strong support system, uh, things could get pretty tough on you sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Yep, and she had four boys to corral. Uh, it, and those guys weren't just sitting around watching TV type of guys either. So they were always oh, they, they were out on their three wheelers trying to get my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Kevin Kevin will have had this thing watched by tomorrow morning, so I'm sure you'll hear from him here in a little bit. So he well, they're, they're they're great kids. They're good kids, and and uh, well, they're not kids anymore, but they'll still always be kids to me. But uh, yeah, all those kids are great. They took after their parents good work ethic and uh, uh look what they're doing now i mean things are just great and uh yep keep the legacy going so that's for yep. sure. some of the best i'm going to list some of the players that you coached in brit um you said you can't remember them all and i don't blame you i can't either remember what i had for lunch yesterday so doug don tom savoy rick burgart sean foy rod conaway rick fangman bob cook chuck anderson tim birchka mark eisman John McDermott, Todd Harvey, Kevin Oster, Osterkamp, Steve Hewling, Greg Rasmussen, Kevin McDermott, Jim Malik, Jim Inksler, Dave Buns, Ron Brooks, Brent Swanson, Dwayne Cook, who I just did a podcast with, Rich Friesman, Ron Fletcher, Pete Earls, Brian Thompson, Jeff Young, and Doug Zool was a list I put together of some of the names that you would have that had. Is that, that is absolutely unbelievable. I can remember every... When you say the name, I can remember every name, and I can almost visualize every every kid. Uh, that there's some good players there. I mean, really good players. And uh, I, I remember uh, the Harvey boy. I think his mom was the uh, secretary at the school for years. Okay. And yep. uh, yeah, good kids really are. Yep. And the fun thing is you said, yeah, a lot of people stay generation after generation. As I'm going through the list, I'm like, yep, that kid just played on this team. I played football with that kid. That kid's uh, nephew, that guy's nephew was on my team. It's just generation after generation. So that's pretty neat. Uh, some un unbelievable. So God, those names bring back a lot of memory. The, the Beery Guard boys, you know, uh, there was Rick and uh, the, the other, there was another. Jay, Jay Burgar. Hey. Yep. Jay and Rick, yep. One was a blonde hair boy, and one was a dark, dark hair yep. boy. Oh God, I, uh, un, un, unbelievable! I sat and, with Jay at the Unidome this fall. It was fun. Oh, uh, did you? Yep. yep. Then I got into playing slow pitch and softball with the uh, some of those guys like Skip Miller and, yep. and those guys. Where I'd open up the gym so we could play pickup basketball. So, and speaking. Nice. Yep, I wanted to mention that to you. You know, he, he should give you a little bit more money on this podcast. I just bought a brand new golf cart from him. So yeah, I, I think that's worth at least another hundred bucks, don't you? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just that's have all... to ask him. I don't know when I'm gonna get it yet. I haven't heard from him, but the weather's not nice yet, so I don't care. So yeah. well, speaking of, guess who my next sponsor is? That's perfect timing. Here we go. Miller and Son golf cars. Family-owned operation with over 50 years of business experience. Skip and Jim Miller, who um, owe at least another $100 to the Sanger Legacy Fund, according to Bob. They worked together with their dad, Monty, until his passing in 1996. Associated with EasyGo, Miller & Sons now calls on over 1,000 golf cars in three states. Companies and courses are always extremely happy with their products, service, and honesty. This has resulted in double-digit growth each passing year. Based in Brit. Miller & Sons employs 18 full-time employees and three part-timers. The next generation is being trained as we speak to ensure long-term stability. For more information, contact them at 
Email them at customer service at millergolfcars.com or visit them at millergolfcars.com. And then the World with Nate podcast is my next sponsor. Nate Allison is the brother of a friend of ours here in Indianola. He has an awesome podcast of his own called The World with Nate. He hits on a lot of great fun topics and his goal is just to inspire people through his podcast. Uh, Nate's from Iowa. He loves helping people reach their dreams. Uh, Check out his podcast, The World with Nate. It's on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you find your podcasts. All right, let's talk about basketball. Let's kind of zoom through uh, your Brit basketball coaching um, because this seemed to be your sport. I want to really hit the Mason City years and then some of your Lake Mills and West Bend years as well. Um, I saw that you coached uh, with Dale Barnhill, if I got that name right, at Brit. Right. And you came in with Dale and then a lady named Myra DeYoung, who became Myra Bowman. Uh, she was my music teacher. And I actually, she had just had a birthday. I think it was yesterday. I wished her a happy birthday on Facebook. So um, how was, how was Brit basketball for you? And then we'll jump into um, some West Bend, some Lake Mills and some Mason City ball. Well, you know, when I, when I came there, I was an assistant basketball coach. They had hired a head coach. So I was assistant for two years. Dale Barnhill, as you said, was a head basketball coach there. Mm -hmm. He came from Twin Cedars uh, Bussey, a small school. Uh, down in southeastern Iowa. And um, we had uh, Bobby Eisman, Mark Eisman. We had a Greg Rasmussen, who was our big, tall kid in the middle. We had a Reinhardt boy. And I, I mean, there were other kids too, but uh, Brit basketball at that time, you know, to be quite honest with you, Brit was a wrestling school. Yep. And Coach uh, Al De Leon just had phenomenal wrestling. Uh, at that time. I mean, Britt dominated everybody in wrestling. So the fo- there wasn't a lot of focus, you know, on basketball at that time, but yet there were some very good athletes on the basketball team at that time. We didn't have a very good record either year. And, you know, I always looked at it like this. When I'm the coach, things squarely fall on my shoulders, you know, when it comes to being successful or not. And I'll talk a little bit about my philosophy a little bit later. We talk about Mason City. But I thought that uh, we had some good athletes. They always played hard. Uh, I remember the one year, and I think maybe Bob talked about it, like we just got through getting beat by Corwith Wesley when they, like, ranked. I think they were ranked number one. I think Bob thought they were number two or three. And uh, they just beat us, and then they came in to – to Brit and we beat him in the sectional play. Oh, wow. Or two. So, and we didn't win very many games that year. But, uh, you know, and lately, I think, you know, Brit, Wes Hancock has had some decent teams. They got down the state tournament. And, mm-hmm. and Brian Peterson was a, uh, a volunteer assistant on the sophomore team. Yep. Uh, he was there as the head coach for a while. And uh, so, but back then, uh, we had some good athletes, but just never showed how competitive I thought we were. But, uh, you know, it is what it is at that time. And I was still young, so I was still learning and uh, trying to find out what was going on and so forth. And I took the head job at West Bend because that was my first head job. I took the head basketball job and the head baseball job. Well, after I took the head job at West Bend and uh, Coach Barnhill left, oh. I'd already committed to West Bend. And, and I'm one of these people that, hey, if you sign a contract, I mean, that's what you should do. I mean, abide by the contract. So you honor it. Yep. I didn't try to get out of the one. I don't know if I would have gotten the job or not. Anyway, at Brit but I didn't try to get out of that. So I did go to West Bend, but they also hired a new coach that, that following years. So uh, I went to West Bend because that was my first head coaching job. Do you think, do you think if uh, you would have gotten the head job right away, or if you would have stuck around and taken it after Barnhill, how do you think you would have been in Brit long-term at that point? Or did you have like bigger school aspirations? What were your thoughts kind of back then? Well, I, I had bigger school uh, aspirations, but, I was always one of these people that if somebody told you you couldn't do something, I, I would try and do it. do it. I mean, you know, you can't win or you can't do this or can't do that. 
Oh yeah, I can. You know why? I mean, that's just yeah. that, that I had. And uh, so my guess is if I would have had a head job at Brit, that I would have been there for a while because then I probably would not have left Brit to go to say like Lake Mills, which is in the same conference, same league class. Let's see, when I went from Brit to West Bend, that was my first head coaching job. And then from West Bend to Lake Mills was a jump higher, you know, with a class. Yeah. And then I went from Lake Mills to Mason City because I always wondered if I could coach at a large school. And at that time, Mason City was the largest, you know, in the area. And I yeah. got the opportunity, so I did. But I think I probably would have stayed at Brit for a while. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and you never know. You had some success, and it might have just – you know, yeah. been, been like I mean, Sanger. Sanger had options to go to bigger schools throughout his career, and he chose to stay. You know, you never know. Yeah, he only stayed there fifty years. That's... Fifty-two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not, <laughs> not not too shabby. But he he oh definitely, my. I know, had opportunities elsewhere, and he um, ended up it ended up how it ended up. So definitely. when you can be a head coach someplace for fifty-two years, you got to be doing something right. But yeah. you know, at the same time, when you coach. You make enemies. That's just the nature of the game. There's not much you can do about it. Yep. Uh, but a lot of people that, you know, maybe dislike you or don't like your coaching style or what you do, a lot of people really don't know you as a person. They just know you, you know, as a coach. Yep. So it it, it makes it it makes it tough. But, uh, yep. Definitely. Yeah. So who knows? I you know I might have stayed there forever. You never know. Yep. Um, did you have success at West Bend and Lake Mills? Yeah, so I, I took the head job at West Bend, and I was there for three years at West Bend. We won the conference two out of three years, my second and third year there. And I, I, I can't remember. I think we were something like 48 and 12 over a three-year period. <laughs> and I also had the head baseball. Then I had the head football for the last two years there. And uh, so we had some pretty very good teams. And then I took the head basketball and baseball job at uh, Lake Mills. And that was right after Bert Hansen. And Bert Hansen was there forever, you know, and he was a girls coach at Indianola forever. Now yep. he's helping with West Des Moines Valley. So actually Bert had a hand in me being hired at Lake Mills when I came nice. over. Uh, he sat down on the interview and, and I helped hire. So uh, then I was at Lake Mills for six years. And then after Lake Mills, I went to Mason City in 1987. Yep. Bert, uh, he's pretty well known down here. He took, what, three teams to state for girls when they had Grace Berg and some of those good girls six, five, six years ago now, whatever it was. He's, he's pretty well known around here. Um, right. So Bert, Bert, Bert was a good coach. Yep. Um, so. Yep. When I was doing the football record book, I was getting stat packets from Coach Sanger's old files, and Bert Hansen was the official stat keeper of the North Iowa Conference. And so he had these old school computer printouts of football stats, and it always said compiled by Bert Hansen. I thought that was pretty neat to see his name on there. <laughs> um, but speaking of West Bend football, the man who took over after you was named what? Who is the coach after Boy, you? Clay Goodchild. I talked to him. John on... was my, he was my assistant coach. Yep. And I, uh... Uh, no, go ahead. And, and, and Coy was a uh, Mallard, went to school at Mallard. Now West Bend Mallard's together. Back then it wasn't. Yep. Uh, Coy was my uh, assistant coach. And I told Coy when I was leaving, I says, this is going to be a good situation. I go, this is because we started probably. Well, I'll bet you 11 or 12 freshmen that last year that I was there and we weren't too bad. Yeah. And it was going to be a heck of a run with those kids. But then when Coy came in, Coy got such a good weight program going that it really uh, took off. And Coy was really good, you know, with the weights and the weight training. And he was one of those, you know, you get some of those big farm kids that are out there working every day on the farm mm -hmm. and putting them in some football pads. They like to go out and hit people, you know. Yeah. And they, they, they put their nose to the grindstone. So West Bend had a lot of those kids, and Coy just carried it over and had a phenomenal success there because his weight program. And I would assume West Hancock's weight program is pretty strong too to have yeah, the team yep. happen. 
So yeah, and I, I bring up Coy Goodchild because I I'm doing a little writing right now for Wes Hancock, trying to do a little project here. And um, when Britt and Wes Ben Mallard played for the first time in 2006 or seven, um, Coy had retired from coaching, but he was still the AD. So I wanted to look up information on Coy. And it said he started his coaching career at West Bend under Bob Horner. And then it said he coached for Bob Sanger for one year. And I was like, that doesn't sound right. I know West Hancock football as well as anybody. And I don't think Goodchild coached in Brit. And so I got a hold of West Bend's head coach today. And I said, do you have Coach Goodchild's phone number? I'd like to talk to him. So I talked to Coy on the phone through text. And I said, can you clear this up for me? He goes, that was a mistake. It was just supposed to say Bob Horner. And I said, well, this is perfect because I'm going to podcast with Bob Horner in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and he goes, you're doing a podcast with Bob Horner? I said, yeah. And he goes, send me the link to that podcast as soon as it, you have it. And so in my phone <laughs> right now, it says send Coy Goodchild podcast link. So yeah, um, he, yeah, he, he, he done a great job. He's a good yeah. guy. I ran into Pearl. him out at uh, Nyack here the other night at a high school game. He had a granddaughter playing. And I don't know if it was for one of the Ankeny teams. Okay. or who it was now but yeah I, I ran into him and and uh yeah he still looks the same he still looks like he could put the pads on and go out and hit somebody so, <laughs> so. Nice. and him and his brothers were quite the football players for uh tom steen over there yep. now tom steen was a head coach and then he and went over. Yep. 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 So. yeah he won a bunch of titles with Dwayne tway and then he took over and won a title himself that next year 2003 a funny story about uh, Dwayne Twait. Uh, I ran into his son. I, I do in softball at Nyack, and we were at Iowa Central. He's the AD at Iowa Central, Dwayne mm -hmm. Twait's son. And uh, my wife and his wife were in the Emmitsburg Hospital, the same room, and both of our daughters were, were born the same day. Oh, wow. My wife, Bev, were in the cool. Emmitsburg Hospital together. So, Nice. So you, Bob Sanger, three state titles, Coy Goodchild, four state titles. Uh, you can add in Dwayne Twait there, seven state titles. You were mixed in with all those coaching legends as well as yourself there. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, they didn't leave any state titles for me. Yeah. They took them. <laughs> oh, you got a couple here we're going to talk about in a minute, just in a different <laughs> sport. So before we get to yeah. Mason City basketball, Got to get to a few more sponsors. Jim Deemer, that's 1973 football team. His uh, Brit Vet Clinic is one of my sponsors. Uh, head to the Brit Vet Clinic for all your small animal vet needs and swine vet services. Call the Brit Vet Clinic at 843-3416 or email them at britvetclinic at gmail.com. The Jay Hiscock State Farm Team in Brit is a proud supporter of Wes Hancock and the Sanger Legacy Fund. They can help with all your insurance needs, including auto, home, life, farm, business, and renter's insurance. For a free quote or review, give Jay or Lindsay a call at 843-3563. Go Eagles, says Jay. And then Nick Schmidt is sponsoring the podcast. He's a 2000 West Hancock graduate and just wanted to give to the Sanger Legacy Fund. So thanks to Nick Schmidt for sponsoring. And then Katie's Salon and Tanning is owned by Katie Walk, mother of two-time state football champion Braden Walk. Uh, they're located on Main Street in Titanka and have been there for the last 16, going on 17 years. Services offered are men's, women's, and children's haircuts, colors, perms, waxing styles, and tanning, plus many brands of retail are available. Find Katie's Salon on Facebook or Instagram. Call them at 928-2303 for appointments. All right, I'm excited for this part. Mason City Basketball. I was telling Bob beforehand that I was in like fourth, fifth, sixth grade when Mason City won state basketball championships in 1996 and 1997. Uh, so as kids, we'd always wait for the paper to come out the next day, see how Mason City did, see how many points Dean Oliver scored, all that good stuff. And speaking of Dean Oliver, I, I'm a little disappointed, but I tried. I contacted the University of Wisconsin Athletics and asked if Dean Oliver would want to come on this podcast with us and talk Mason City basketball. Just so happened that he's busy and couldn't make it, but they sent their best wishes to you from, from Dean. So I tried, I, I was like, ah, I was hoping that would work, but it, it, that would have been cool. That would have been, been neat. I still, I still get to golf with him once or twice every summer. Okay. Uh, come back. So, uh, we'll go golfing. So, uh, he should stick to basketball. Yeah. 
<laughs> and tell him to check his Facebook message. I sent him a Facebook message, even though we're not Facebook friends, because obviously he doesn't know who I am. And uh, sometimes when you're not Facebook friends, you don't see the message. So I was a little bit right. didn't see it. I was hoping it would work out, but they said he had a, a conflict in his schedule. But so yeah, you went to Mason City in 1987 and stayed as the head coach until 2004. Um, you were 344 and 214 overall as a head coach and 221 and 153 at Mason City is what I found at least. And if that's wrong, let me know. Um, was it tough adjusting to a 4A style of ball, a bigger school than Lake Mills? Well, and then, you know, everybody said, uh, I, I remember when I was at Lake Mills, uh, you know, we had some good teams there. I went to state tournament in 87, beat a very good Garner team with the uh, a uh, Lindemann kid and Lupnik and Powell and but but anyway, make a long story short, there there's not a lot of difference. It's just you have more kids that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. But as far as X's and O's, uh, doing things and seeing things on the floor, uh, the biggest thing is relationship. You know, if you can't if you can't be a good teacher uh, on the basketball court. You're not going to be a good teacher in the classroom. That goes hand in hand. And I know a lot of people that I think know a lot about the game, but they have a hard time getting it across to the kids because they don't relate to them, you know, the way they should. Yep. But, and, you know, but it, it wasn't that difficult, really. Uh, I didn't know that it was going to be like that, you know, until I got there because I always wondered, well, hey, can I coach at a big school? And, uh, I remember some people telling me that it would be tough. I remember uh, one of my better athletes over at Lake Mills, uh, Mike Middlestad, who was a heck of an athlete for Lake Mills. His dad was the funeral director of Middlestad Funeral Home over there. And uh, I remember when I took the job, Horner, they're going to eat you up over there. They're going to eat you up. You're not going to get out of it. I says, okay, yeah, you know, we'll see. And one of those, well, hey, you tell me I can't do something, then I'm going to go do it. So. But no, it, it wasn't that big of a, a change. It really wasn't. So yep. expectations about the same. Were they a little higher, a little more pressure about on par? Well, at at that time, they hadn't had a winning season in over 10 years. So I think 1977 was the last time they had had a winning season in basketball. So the expectations weren't high, but yep. they've gone through a few coaches in between there. And, uh, you know, I know they were hungry, but I came into a situation where uh, the AD told me, he says, well, I think you're going to have some decent kids. Mm -hmm. and, and he was right. We had some kids right away. Uh, we went 11 and 10, 11 and 10, my first two years. And second year, we came one basket from making it to the state tournament. Oh. We got beat by East, by uh, Waverly Shell Rock, and they had a Bergman boy. And they wound up going to the state. But then after that, we had a group that was known as the Bomb Squad. Uh, and that's because we were kind of like a little Palmer Pomeroy where we would launch up the threes anytime we had a look at it. Yeah. And those were the Scott and Clint Epperly and Todd Johnson and Mark Melman, who's a longtime salesman now for Deckers. Ryan Johnson was our big guy. Uh, we had a ton of kids, Troy Rude coming off. I mean, there, there was that bomb squad really kind of set the tone for everything. And we were over like a two year period with the bomb squad. Uh, we had a phenomenal record, 40 some and, and, and six. We always got beat by East Waterloo, who had Frank Davis, Cortez McGee, and they were state champions and runner up one year. And they were in our conference. And then we always got beat by Ames, who had Fred Hoiberg. Canes and, and those. So uh, those teams are really good. But then when the uh, Dean Oliver years came, it, it was just a dream come true as a coach. Uh, you know, coaches uh, are only as good as the players that they have. Yep. And I was fortunate to have good players no matter where I've been. You're going to have up and down years, but you're going to have more up years than you will down years, you know, if, if you have a good system going. Because yeah. you're with, you know, you can't recruit in high school. You're going to coach with what you have. Yeah. Uh, 96, 97, the 96 year with Dean 
when he was a junior, we had two seven foot kids. I mean, they were six eleven, seven foot. Steve Heston and a Brand Harriman, and then you throw in another very athletic off guard and another athletic guard in there. You had a pretty good dream team. So, what were their names? The two guards. The two guards, Mike King and Matt Bartels. Okay. And they were just athletic as heck. Could jump out of the gym. They were about six one. 6-2, and then you had Dean at the point, and then you had the two big kids, and then we had some kids that come off the bench, and Tony, Tony Callahan, and Mark Callahan, and Steve Loker, and uh, I mean, everybody knew their roles, and when you know your roles in the game of basketball, that's when you become a dangerous team, and yeah. when the kids know their roles, uh, that's that's what's important. You know, people say, well, did you ever have only certain kids shoot? No, I never told a kid not to shoot the basketball. I just didn't believe in that. I said, if you got the open shot, I want you to take it. Those kids are smart enough. They know who to get the ball to. I didn't have one who to get the ball to. Yeah. And when they had the freedom like that, I think that they And so we had kids that take some shots that they were open, but I would never get upset about taking a shot. I would get upset with the mental mistakes if we made it two, three times, and I would be making a bad pass or bad shot. But but that that team there, those two years going back to back was unbelievable. The yeah. pressure was on us the second year. We got we got beat one game or in '96, and what people didn't realize, we went a whole week without practice because. Mm-hmm had snowstorm and it was a whole week and if we didn't have school we couldn't practice well Ankeny practiced every day yeah we got beat by three that's the only game we came back and beat it by 20 some but they had a team with the Sears brothers and that but I, I'm not so sure if we would have been able to maintain our rhythm and stuff like that that we couldn't have gone undefeated in 96 and then 97 uh, we had everybody back except for one big kid and uh, a lot of pressure on the kids, but boy, they handled it. And believe it or not, we, I, I ne- as a coach, I never talked about winning and losing. Winning and losing comes. You don't need to talk about that kind of stuff. Yep. You don't talk about who good, you know, we're going to be this good or we're going to go get a state championship. You, you never want to say that because if that doesn't happen, then that doesn't, that doesn't bode well for you and your team. Yep. So. We, we never talked about that stuff. We just talked about doing things the right way. And yep. it's a big stickler on being gentlemen, being humble. Uh, you know, we don't need the, the signs with the three pointers going up and all the other, I, I, you know, that just wasn't us. And, you know, after a, a big win or something like that, we get over to the sideline and we would shake hands and go through the line and, we wouldn't mock anybody or make anybody feel bad. We would do our celebration in the locker room. And that's just the type of kids that they were. But as a coach, that 96, 97 team, just dream team. And at the same time, I had I had good assistance with me. I had a good report. Dave Sassetti was with me for 13, 14 years. And uh, him and I were so good together. And I think that's important when you have assistance that you can trust and that you can work together. Mm-hmm. And that was really also part of it. So, and kids can see when you get along with your coaches and assistants, you know, they can get that feeling and stuff. Like yep. that. And uh, everything just went really smooth. Then the second year we wound up 14th in USA today. Nice. So Cool. And, and it's funny, my mind started wandering. You talked about, we didn't celebrate. We didn't mock anybody. You kind of sound like that guy you started coaching with back in 1976 in Brit, you know, no, you know, win or lose, you go shake hands, you run off the field. We don't gloat. We don't show off. Uh, maybe some of that stuff rubbed off on you. It sounded like, well, well you know, exactly. I just don't think the stuff that, that people see on TV today, you know, sometimes it's just to me to the game, you know, how people taunt and things like that. But that yep. that's kind of old, I guess. And I guess 
you can put a lot of that back on the way Bob was and, and how I first started my coaching, you know, being around people. So uh, we went through things business-like. Let's take care of our business. Then when we get off, we don't need to rub anybody's noses in it. We can yep. celebrate in private. Yep. How close were the state championship games? Were they close games in the finals or did you blow them out? Yeah, well, they, they were all they were all pretty close games. Uh, in set in 96, uh, the final game, uh, we beat Iowa City uh, high by Glenn Worley and oh, Kate. Yeah. Kading, who was a football kicker, yep. the Chargers for a long time. Yep. Uh, they had a real good team. We won that winning by about, I believe, 12 or 13. And the other games before that, we played Ricky Davis and, and Davenport North. That yep. was like a seven or eight point game. And uh, our other game, I can't remember in 96, uh, who was well, but I probably should have went back and looked it up. But, uh, <laughs> I should have too. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. And then in, in 97, we beat uh, Iowa City or uh, Sioux City West. We had Kyle Galloway and Dean had 38 points that game and Kyle Galloway had 38. And I the name of uh, Kurt Heinrich uh, yep. was played for Iowa City West. We won that game by 13 in the championship game. So, but all the game, once you get down there, nerves set in and how it is, it, it's all how you handle those things. And yep. uh, our kids have been there before, but it had to be a lot of pressure on the kids trying to repeat because at that time, yep. you know, you didn't repeat. There wasn't another repeat until Ames came along with, you know, Barnes and McDermott. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was really special. We'll never be anything like that. That's why some people say to me, uh, uh, why, do, why do I still coach? I've done everything that I can do. I just like being around it. I do the high school girls softball city now. And this year I'm doing assistant NIAC softball. And I just, I enjoy being around it. It's, I, I can't give it up. It's just yep. something there that I know if I give it up, I may never get it back because uh, in 2004, when I gave up the high school basketball year, that's because I was missing my son's games. He was yep. a junior, senior at Iowa and I wanted to go to his games and I was never able to get the job, you know, back again. So once you give it up, you never know, you're never guaranteed you're going to get it back. So yep. right now it's kind of hard for me. And especially at 74 years old, you know, I give up coaching. There's not too many people that want old codgers around anymore coaching. Uh, so, uh, yep. you know, uh, yeah. so I'm a current coach, they still make me young. And then the other teams, we, we've gone to the state tournament uh, five times since I've been here in Mason City. Two other times, three with Dean and two other times with Jeff. Yep. Uh, and uh, those were special too. Like Dean Oliver is probably the best point guard that yeah. I've ever coached. And F is probably the next for me. And I've always told those two, I said, if, if Jeff would have had Dean's quickness and Dean would have had Jeff's size, they'd probably still be playing in the NBA today. Yeah. That's, you know, how it, how it was. So, but, uh, you know, we, we had some great players and not only those two kids, but the kids around them, like in Jeff's group, uh, we had a Cody Heisman. Yeah. Yep. We who went on to play football. Uh, we we had, all, you know, just a ton of kids. And I, and I can't think of everybody's name off the top of my head, but so many kids that have been integral parts in my life that I'll never realize how much they meant to me. Because sometimes they think, you know, coaching, you just go on and go on. But uh, I'm forever grateful for, for the kids that I've had, the kids I've been able to coach. Even some kids that didn't care for me or a parent or something like that, I was never one to hold a grudge. I just, you know, I just go and coach. I, I thought it was kind of funny, Dan, because somebody would say, well, you don't want to get the coach mad at me. He'll hold a grudge against my son or daughter. Well, that, that's furthest from the truth. I'm going to play the best kids who are going to help us win, no matter who you are, what you think of me. You're still going to play 
you're the better kid to play. I don't care who it is. So. Yeah, exactly. And I love that you just mentioned Cody Heisman. I went to college with Cody um, down in Pella. He transferred from Iowa for his last couple of years at Central, and he was a stud at Central uh, as a wide receiver. Holy cow. Oh, he was he was just a great athlete. Yep. He was one of the better athletes to go through the school to play more than one sport. Him and Jeff. Of course, Dean never did anything else besides play basketball. Oh, he was a basketball player, but uh, he could have played all, but just decided yep. to. But yeah, yep. Coach Jeff were probably two of the best all around athletes who have gone through the high school year. Yep. He, uh, oh man, he was fun to watch. Um, yeah. He's still <laughs> coaching at, at Central and Pella, and he works at the school there. So he's, he's done a lot of good stuff down there. Yep. So definitely. So, um, you're so Jeff, you're talking about Jeff here. Uh, his senior year, 31.2 points a game, 18.7 rebounds a game, and 6.8 assists per game. That when I was doing my research, I was like, holy cow, those numbers, those I had to double check to make sure I got the numbers right. I was like, are those accurate? But then I remember I used to go, you know, check the paper when Jeff was playing and we'd always be dropping 40, 50 points on teams. And he was, he was pretty phenomenal. Um, what about when he went on to Iowa? Uh, what do you remember from his Hawkeye days? Well, you know, I, I think one of the biggest regrets that Jeff had was after his senior year, uh, he wanted to play baseball and coach Alford made those guys come down to Iowa city in the summer and take classes and play in the primetime league. And to this day, that's the biggest regret Jeff has not playing a senior year of baseball. Yeah. That time, you know, they were told, you don't come down here. Somebody else might, you know, get ahead of you, whatever it may be. And, uh, but as things turned out, Jeff knows now that he probably was going to start anyway or play anyway, right away. So he wishes he would play baseball, but the, the recruiting process, it kind of got me used to it when I had Dean because Dean had that recruiting process and I went to, with him to a lot of football games down at Iowa City, also to uh, Coach Davis's house because he's the one that recruited Dean. And there was even times when we had Jeff like in seventh grade at Coach Davis's house where he was actually talking to him too. And, and it, it's, it's a different feeling. You get used to it. I had no idea what Jeff wanted to do. Uh, my wife and I went on a visit, official visit at Iowa State and at Iowa. And actually, Iowa State, Coach Eustachie offered him first. Yeah. And uh, then we went and visited Iowa. And then when Coach Alford offered him, he says, yep, this is right. And didn't even talk to I mean, we didn't even know because he didn't say anything to Coach Eustachie yet. And when Alford offered him, he said, yes, I, I want to come here. So, and, and Devin, I didn't even know. So it was kind of like off the cuff thing. Everybody thinks he had it locked up, which he really liked Iowa State too. But Iowa was just there, you know, with Dean and all the contacts and probably just a natural thing for him to do. Yeah. And uh, then after he did it so early when he was a freshman, then, you know, a lot of schools backed off. He had some schools say, if you ever change your mind, uh, we would like to know. One was zoned with Rossboro, and but you know you you'll never know because him and Dean both committed so early that yep really never went through the recruiting process. So yep. did you get four or five schools that wanted Jeff to play football? Yeah, yeah, you would have done well there too, and, and some places that uh, want to play football. So cool. Um, did you get to know Coach Alford very well as a as a person during those four years, or was he pretty reserved, or what was Alford no, like? No, I, I got to know. We still get a Christmas card from him yeah. all these years. So, but uh, no, I, I you know I got to know him. And sometimes you know I think he got a bad rap, and sometimes because he really wasn't the way you know people perceived him to be. He was really down to earth. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, you know, when you talk to him and stuff like that, but, uh, yep. but the fan base was pretty hard on him, I think. And I, I think when everything kind of blew up, you know, with that Pierre Pierce situation really, really was tough on, on everybody. Yep. And so, yep. 
And I, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Alford kind of got, I think he got kind of a bad rap. You know, people make perceptions about a person and it's hard to shake that, um, that perception. And he wasn't, I don't think the most well-liked guy, but I've heard from now you and a few others that are like, no, he, it's kind of hard guy to read on TV when you're watching him, but he was a pretty good, pretty good guy. Right. Right. And then his family was, was great. And they were great to Jeff. Uh, you know, I, I know, I know Jeff still stays in contact at some points, but you know, with Jeff being in the coaching, I know that Jeff's down at Truman state right now and has some success. You, you hope those other coaches can help, you know, at that next level when you get into the coaching. Yeah. There's a coaching at that level is all a network. They have their network of coaches and it's hard yeah. to break in there. And, and I know that's what Jeff is trying to do. And so I know he keeps a relationship with the, the coaches that he's had. Yep. That's good. Yep. I'm going to hit a, our last couple sponsors and we're going to kind of wrap things up. Okay, Bob. That sounds right. good. First state bank takes takes pride in their community-based values, wants to be your bank. They take pride in serving the Eagle Nation communities. They can personalize your banking products to meet the needs of your busy life with free internet banking and their mobile banking app with mobile deposit. Try their bill pay services. First State Bank backs our Eagles 24-7, just like their service to you. First State Bank, whether it's personal, business, real estate, or ag loans, they have products to serve you best. That's First State Bank and Brit. And then Daniels Auto Collision in Charles City, owned by Jason Daniels, 1990 West Hancock grad. Whether you need a minor fix-up or complete collision repair, Daniels Auto Collision is North Iowa's premier auto body shop and will have your vehicle back on the road looking better than new. With over 30 years experience and all major insurances accepted, why take your chances with anyone other than Daniels Auto Collision? Call them at 641-220-3805. Email them at danielsautocollision at gmail or check them out at danielsautocollision.com. And my last sponsor for the night is Kelly Real Estate. They've been in business for 62 years, starting with Paul Kelly. Paul handed the business off to Steve and Deanna in 2017. They have been involved with the business for over 20 years themselves and enjoy it. It's a great way to get to know people and get involved with the community. Kelly Real Estate this year added Rachel Swanson to their team and also office manager Nora Clark. So if you're looking for just the right starter home, the perfect forever home, or a unique fixer-upper, or even transition into your retirement, call Kelly Real Estate at 843-4102. So going to uh, Jeff here before we wrap it up, he's coaching at Truman State. He was at uh, Valley before that, right? Right. Um, And then North Dakota as well. I assume you follow his teams pretty closely. How did their season end up this year? Uh, they wound up 20 and 10 overall. They made it to the NCAA uh, tournament again. Last year, they, they went to the uh, Elite Eight and got beat by Flagler, Florida to go to the Final Four by one point. Oh, yeah. And uh, so he said they won the conference now two years uh, out of the three uh, that he's been there. So, I mean, he's had a good year. Uh, things been going good he's lost a couple of good kids this year to the transfer portal oh, yeah. uh, kids that are leaving think they can go d1 and 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 play d1 and you know if they can they can you never know unless you try so yep definitely gonna have to replace a couple of real good kids but uh, things have been going good for him and uh can't complain you know worry about his health he went through uh testicular cancer here last year and about a year and a half now and went through some pretty rough chemotherapy in that and uh, uh, it's been tough, but I just had a checkup here last week and scans and things still seem to be okay. So that's good. Thankful for that. So, uh, you know, th- things are going good. Uh, you were talking about Kelly real estate. Uh, yep. I bought the first house from Paul Kelly. Yep. Uh, dad. And, and uh, I was walking my dog the other night over here in Asbury Oh, it's probably been a couple months ago. Got talking with this gal that was on the swing set. It was Rachel Swanson. And I, I didn't know uh, who it was, but she must say, is she a Smith where her brothers played football? I, I, I think sounds maybe, right, but I'm not 100% yeah, sure. I think her brother played on the football team. So she okay. got talking about it. And, and she's the one that's with the real estate. They got a couple houses over here in Asbury. Uh, okay. Edition over here at Mason City. So cool, small world. Who you run into with your sponsors and how many people? 
unbelievable. So yeah, it's fun. They had a, got a lot of good people on this. So yeah. And speaking of those sponsors, I'm going to mention them one last time real quick and then my next podcast, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. So thanks again to the Brit car truck, bike and tractor night cruise, Ewing funeral home and monument company, Jay Hiscox, a state farm, first state bank, Mojo productions, Daniel's auto collision, Katie salon and tanning, Deemer realty, Nick Schmidt, Kelly real estate, sidetrack lanes, Wilson's diner, Brit food center, Levi Don trucking, Miller and sons golf cars, Brit Vet Clinic, The World with Nate Podcast, and Johnson Drainage. Uh, next up in a few weeks, I'll have Jeff Nielsen, a uh, state champion in track, John Weiland, another state champ in track and all-around good athlete, Paul Haugie, a former teacher, the 2011 and 2012 state girls basketball teams, and then Steve Kelly, speaking of the Kellys. And plus, I've booked my entire 2022 lineup and one I'm really excited about is at the end of the year, I'm doing it with about five or six former elementary teachers from Brit Elementary. A couple are still uh, teaching, but some have retired. Um, so I'm looking to get a lot of sponsors from former students for that episode. All right, Bob, we're going to wrap it up. Any last words you want to throw out there? Any shout well, outs? Yeah, I just minutes? had to start. I just had to start chuckling here when you said Jeff Nielsen. So my, my second year at, uh, at Brit, Bob needed an assistant track coach. I said, Bob, I don't know anything about track, just like the deep end. That's all right. So I was assistant track coach. We came in second in state. Yep. That was Nielsen. I yep. said, well, how'd you do? We got second in state. We have one guy plays like first or second in four events. Yep. One that played the, we got second place. So I kind of chuckled at that. That's on my resume as state track coach. There you go. <laughs> Thanks did to you ever, Nielsen, you have to tell them. Yeah, they're good people. Uh, did you ever hear the story about when he got to college and he was running at Simpson? And I believe it was, I'm going to ask him the specifics on this, but the legend has it that he was um, at Drake Relays, I think it was, and he looked over and Herschel Walker was in the lane next to him for the 100 meter dash. And he's like, oh, oh we're, we're not in Brit, Iowa anymore here. So... <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I I just want to thank you though for having me on and and uh, yeah, you know a, a shout out to the Sangers and and to their kids and Linda and hopefully everybody stays healthy and uh, uh, for what you're doing for the Sanger uh, legacy is just unbelievable and uh, great to be on. I really appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, Bob. Go Eagles. Yep.